Hi everyone, welcome back to chapter 7 of The Girl of Ink and Stars. Um, so the, oh, last week we got to um, chapter 6 and we found out that Loop has now gone into the forest um, after the killer, we, we presume, of, um, of Kata. Um, and now Isabella is going to try and go in after her, we presume. Um, because she said, I'd done this and now I've got to fix it. So uh, let's see what happens. I closed our broken door as best I could, sliding to the floor. The threads of problems dangled in front of me, and I tried to think of a way to weave them into the solution. I had to go after her, and for that I would need a horse too. Where from I had no idea. And anyway, if anyone saw a girl out alone near the forest after what happened to Kata, they'd surely stop me. Maybe they'd already stopped Loop. I took a deep breath. She couldn't have gone far. Not Loop with her taffeta gowns and easy laugh, crossing into the forgotten territories. Pep sauntered over, rubbing his head against my limp hand. What do I do, Pep? How do I fix this? He poured my hand until I stroked his back, ginger fur wafting in the air. I paused and he nudged me with his head, but I watched the hairs floating until an idea started to form. It was not one I wanted, but no others came. I stood and crossed to the kitchen, where Miss Lava was asleep in her coop. Taking a knife to my bedroom, I wrapped my plait twice around my hand and pulled it taut. Then I began to saw upwards, slicing roughly. Some strands were pulled out, breaking before the knife reached them. The pain was like sparks popping against my scalp. Finally, the plait came away, and I fell on, and fell on the floor. My head felt light, dizzying. I hacked at the longer pieces, until I was left with something resembling a boy's haircut. Gabo's chest crouched in the opposite corner and I heaved it open, a cloud of dust mushrooming as the lid banged the wall. Coughing, I dressed quickly in a faded cotton tunic and trousers, pulling a jacket over the top. They were short at the wrists and ankles. So much time had passed, inches of time since they had last been worn. I took a deep breath and looked into the polished metal. Gabo blinked back at me, his eyes wide with astonishment. The next moment he had gone, and I turned away, heart pounding, mouth dry. The broken pieces of Dad's walking stick were on Gabo's bed, glowing with their strange light. Picking out the largest piece, I wrapped it in my discarded dress. Something like that would come in handy. Loop's note went to my pocket, her locket around my neck. I'm coming, Loop. Dad bolted the shutters in his study. I lit two candles which made circles in the dark. Even though this was a rescue mission, I could not waste this chance to map the forgotten territories. Emptying his satchel of books, I began to fill it with, with cartography equipment, ink, quills, paper, a leather pad to mark miles, a compass, dragon tree sap for repairing shoes and ripped maps, two drinking flasks. Then his weapon, bought in Afric, a flat curved blade serrated at the edges like teeth. Finally, carefully, I took Mars' map of joy from the wall. I rolled the map into a tight scroll, wrapped it in a piece of soft cloth and nestled it next to the fragment of walking stick. I carried the now heavy satchel back into the main room. Pep was sitting on the bench. Listen, Pep, I said. He rolled onto his back, waiting for his tummy to be rubbed. Cats never understand the gravity of a situation. I have to leave you alone for a while, but I'll leave the back door open and plenty of water bowls. And you'll be all right, won't you? My eyes were pricking with tears, but I knew he would be fine. He was astray until two years ago and was always out catching mice and ravens. Seeing the tummy rub was not forthcoming, he yawned and jumped off the table, slinking through the gap in the broken front door. Goodbye then, I said feebly. I filled my drinking flasks and then all the bowls in the kitchen with water and food and propped open the back door. Miss La woke up as the breeze ruffled her feathers and began picking at the latch. I was about to open it when there was a firm knock that pushed the front door further off its hinges. The next knock sent it crashing to the floor. Two men stood in the doorway. Sorry about that, said one, not sounding very sorry. It was almost like that when we found it yesterday. I nodded. I nodded. I hadn't practised my boy voice yet. Is your mother in, son? The other man said kindly. I shook my head. We won't be with you much bother. We've just got to collect any chickens you have. Why? The governor's going on an expedition, and the first began. Governor's... Official business, interrupted the other, need supplies. An expedition? His girl's gone missing, Loop. Her name twisted in my stomach. The governor knew she was missing. He was going after her. No chickens, I croaked. Miss La, on cue, emitted a piercing squawk. The kinder man gave me an apologetic smile as the other pushed roughly past. 
Governor Adori's orders. Wait a minute. He frowned at the map-covered walls and table. This the cartographer's house? The one in the Dadalo? I nodded. He's my father. Ah. The man shifted as I heard the catch on Miss Lau's coop side open. What have you been told? Told what? Your father, he's... Let's go, said the other man as he emerged from the kitchen. Miss Lau looked at me indignantly. He's what? I said, heart-thumping. We'll be gentle with her, said the kinder man, ignoring my question and taking her softly in his hands. Cook won't be, sneered the other. Other. Hush! But I stopped listening. I felt numb to it all. What had the guard been going to tell me about Da? They left me alone in the whispering room, thinking. The expedition would not leave without the chickens. I, if I beat the chickens back to the governor's house, the expedition would not leave without me. The late afternoon sun danced on the crystals of the governor's basalt mansion, mansion, smudging it into a shimmering mirage. One night, not long after Ma died, Dar had taken me and Gabbo to the cliffs to sit and watch the moon throw light off the house. There are two kinds of crystals, he told us. One is granite, a light-coloured rock, and like you two, it has a twin, a darker version of itself. Its name is Gabbro. After that, I'd called Gabbo Gabbro for a while. He hadn't liked it. As I got closer, the satchel slapping my thigh, I saw that even the windows glinted. The governor had a huge had sh had had huge sheets of glass made from molten gramira sand. A room at the front of the house was filled with people. Voices drifted across me to the open through the open window. Two guards stood by the dark wood door. I had not thought this part through. What if no one would let me in? I crept to the open window. We're wasting time here. We need to get after her. Let's not waste. We have to plan this. And how do we guarantee your daughter's safety? Madness. Who knows where she is? I took Loop's note from my pocket and ripped off the top and bottom, so it read, I'm going across the forest to find out who could cut her. Maybe when we get back, we can be friends again. Love, Loop. I peeped inside. There are about a dozen men in the governor's, in governor's blue, crowded around a large, ornately covered table, carved table. No one was looking my way. Without stopping to think better of it, I pushed my satchel through the window and tumbled in after it. And that is the end of chapter seven. So, Isabella has got a plan now. She is going to, she's heard this news, sort of, well, a hint of news about her dad from the, um, the two of Governor Dory's guards. And now she is going to try and join the expedition. So find, so she'll find a way, hopefully, of getting to loop because the governor now knows that she's missing so what do we think is going to happen next as ever send me your thoughts or just think about them yourself um and looking forward to the next chapter <laughs>